I'm Priyanka Ravi, I go by Pinky as well. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about how to enhance your Kubernetes experience with GitOps and Flux. So I'm gonna be talking about like what is Flux, so I mean, what is GitOps, what is Flux, what their benefits are. So if you're familiar with that, that's gonna be like a little bit of an overview. And then I'm gonna be talking about some tools that will make your um, experience with Flux and GitOps better. And then um, I'm gonna be showing a demo at the end uh, of like a setup I have where it's setting up your EKS clusters using the Terraform controller, which I'll get to. So, um, uh, <laughs> I like showing pictures of my dogs. <laughs> um, I'm a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks. And before I joined Weaveworks um, about like a year and a few months ago, I worked at um, a, a large insurance or a company that, um, and at that company I was, um, I led the effort to set up GitOps on our on-prem Kubernetes solution. So that's where I like learned, that's my experience with Flux and um, I am an end user, so I like doing these talks to like help other end users with their experiences. Um, okay, so if you're not familiar with Weaveworks, uh, we are a globally distributed and remote workforce. And um, a lot of what we do is actually based on open source. So you might have heard of our projects Flux and Flagger, which are actually um, CNCF graduated projects. So we created them and then donated them to the CNCF. And um, Flux was actually the project that kicked off the term GitOps. So our CEO, um, Alexis Richardson, is the one that coined that term. And um, it's been really great to see it grow to what it is now and to see like the adapter, adopters list and the people that actually offer it in their own tools, such as um, Microsoft, AWS, VMware, um, and now GitLab actually has, um, their, their get, they announced their GitOps offering is gonna be using Flux too, which is really exciting. So um, another project we have is Cortex, and it's uh, a, another project in the CNCF that helps make Prometheus scalable, and um, Prometheus is a really cool key part of the progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. And, um, Flagger, I mean, I'll, I'll mention it later in the talk, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So um, we have a lot more projects as well. So if you're interested, definitely check us out on GitHub under Weaveworks, as well as within the CNCF. Like I mentioned, we have a bunch of projects. So yeah, and then this is where you can find us. Um, yeah, feel free to store us on GitHub at either of our locations. Um, and then, yeah, so that's, that's where you can check out the Flux docs. Um, Join the CNCF Slack if you ever wanna like communicate with us. We're really active in the um, Flux channel. So yeah, if you have any questions about Flux or like your experience, that's, that's a good place to start. Okay, so what is GitOps? Um, I, GitOps is the operating model for cloud native applications such as Kubernetes, but I do wanna highlight that it's not just for Kubernetes. Um, if you are doing a multi-cloud infrastructure, you can still use GitOps but because we're gonna be talking about Flux, we're gonna be focusing on Kubernetes. Um, and so basically what it does is it utilizes a version controlled system, most commonly Git, but um, there are other sources you can use as well, like an OCI repository. Um, and so it uses that as a single source of truth. So it enables continuous delivery through automated deployment, monitoring and management by a version controlled system. And through with the whole idea behind GitOps is that you're managing your infrastructure and applications declaratively. And so we have these GitOps principles that were created by the um, GitOps working group. And they're not, I would say like even if you don't meet all of these, I wouldn't be discouraged. Like you can, you know, grow your GitOps setup and, and start simple and then enhance your setup later. But th these um, principles were developed through many conversations with end users to kind of see, you know, uh, what they were doing and like what's what defines GitOps. So the first one is that a system managed by GitOps must have its desired state expressed declaratively. And there's a lot of benefits that come with writing your code, uh, like having your um, desired state expressed declaratively, such as it's it's reusable. There's an audit trail. You know, if you want to see what's actually supposed to be deployed out there you can just go look at the code, which is really cool. Um, also, the second one is that a desired state is stored in a way that enforces immutability, versioning, and retains a complete version history. So there's no like sneaking in a change. Again, it goes back to like the whole compliance trail and the audit trail. 
and stuff like that. So, um, and then software agents automatically pull the desired state declarations from the source and they are continuously observing actual system state and attempting to apply the desired state. And those are important because you're, the whole idea is that it's, it's a pull model versus like the push, like the CICD push model. Um, you're actually having something that's li living in your cluster. It's <laughs> a weird way to put it. Uh, <laughs> deployed in your cluster and is actually listening for your desired state and making sure that's what's always um, realized in your, your cluster. So, <clears throat> um, I wanted to mention the GitOps benefits. So, there's three main value props that I like to mention of GitOps, which are security, velocity, and reliability. Um, with GitOps' tool's unique ability to treat everything as code, it creates a direct impact on security. So, for example, if all configuration and security policy is treated as code, then everything can be held in um, version control. So. There's, like, and any change that's made is reviewed, it's input into an automated process, right? There's no manual processes, which is nice because it means you're less likely to be at work on a weekend. Um, so yeah, we have stronger security guarantees, increased developer and operational productivity because you're not, you know, doing manual processes and stuff like that, so, yeah. All right, now, what is Flux? I guess I'll pause here. Does anyone have any questions about, like, the, the term GitOps and what that means? No, good, okay, okay. <laughs> so um, what is Flux? So Flux is a Git-centric package manager for your applications. And like I mentioned, um, I, don't, I, don't, I kinda mentioned it with GitOps, but um, specifically with Flux, it's not just Git. There are several sources that can be used with Flux, um, such as S3 buckets, um, like I mentioned earlier, OCI repositories, um, OCI registries, sorry, um, and, and other things like that. So. There's a few um, options, and so it's a uh, it's it provide it, pro <laughs> it provides a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions for Kubernetes, and it's really a natural extension of the benefits of Kubernetes because it was created with Kubernetes in mind. And um, at the core, what Flux does is it continuously monitors your version control system, and it applies the desired state that's stated there. Um, and the nice part of this is that you don't have to worry about configuration drift because it runs on a schedule, whatever you set. So if for some reason someone goes in and changes something um, unintentionally or intentionally, then it'll actually set it back to what your desired state says. So um, in the generic case, your, whatever your YAML states, right, it'll set that back. Um, and it really reduces the developer burden because it also removes the need for manual deployment processes like I mentioned earlier. And um, the Flux command line is a really convenient tool to get started using it. I'll, sh I'll, I'll go over it when I'm showing like the demo. But um, yeah, so uh, some of the benefits of it is that it reduces the developer burden. It also removes like the cube control problem. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but I have, where you don't have to worry about cube control versions to be able to interact with the cluster. Sometimes that's a pain, <laughs> I've experienced that. Um, also, it's really extensible, it's very modular. It's um, a microservice architecture, so you can kind of pick and choose like what you want your experience to look like with it. Um, and it's, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it was really designed with Kubernetes in mind, and it comes with out of the box support for customize and Helm as well. All right, so. These are some of the benefits of Flux. So um, Flux provides GitOps for both apps and infrastructure. And um, sorry, um, using Flux and Flagger, you can actually also deploy apps using Canaries. So I mentioned I would I would hit on Flagger a little bit. So Flagger lets you do um, progressive delivery also. So um, pairing it with Flux means you can use GitOps, but also deploy apps with Canaries, feature flags, AB rollouts. Um, Flux can also manage any Kubernetes resource. And if you use the Terraform controller, which I'll mention in a second, you can manage things that are even outside of Kubernetes, which is cool. Um, and then infrastructure and workload dependency management is built in. Um, basically, you just uh, push to Git and Flux does the rest. It manages your, your deployments through automatic reconciliation. Reconciliation is the term we use for when it um, actually applies your changes. So um, it also works with your existing tools. Like I said, it was, really um, built to work with everything that's like common within Kubernetes. So it works with um, your, all your Git providers, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, it can, like I said, you can even use S3 buckets as a source. 
um, all major container registries as well, and all CI workflow providers, as well as it works with a lot of co common Kubernetes tooling, such as customized Helm, RBAC, and policy-driven validation, such as OPA, Kyverno, admission controllers. So it really just falls into place with whatever you're doing already right now. It's, it's very um, easy to set up. And we also say it does multi-tenancy and multi-everything because it can do, um, it uses true Kubernetes RBAC via impersonation and supports multiple Git repositories. And you can do multi-cluster infrastructure as well, and it works out of the bo box with cluster API. Um, you can also use one Kubernetes cluster to either manage um, other clusters or the sa like that cluster itself. So you can set it up to do multi-cluster in that way. Or as, as, as in my experience, I did um, soft multi-tenancy where we had the one cluster and then namespaces. And so we did, we did our multi-tenancy that way. Um, also, Flux alerts and notifies. It's really easy to set up um, health assessments or alerting to external systems such as Slack. So you could just do like a git push and then get notified in Slack like, hey, this change was made. Um, or in the case of drift detection, you can get notified in Slack saying, hey, I noticed that this change has been made. Like there's, th there's something that's not congruent with your um, desired state. Um, and also, um, we like to say users trust Flux. I, I feel like I have uh, validate, like I'm, I'm valid in saying that just because I was an end user. And the Flux community, I've been, we've gotten a lot of feedback about how like easy the Flux community is to work with. And like I mentioned, we're really responsive in the Slack channel. And we welcome contributors of any kind. Um, the components of Flux are on Kubernetes core controller runtime, so anyone can contribute and its functionality can be extended very easily. And there's a lot of like beginner friendly contributions you can do as well. So we really do appreciate anything like that. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, Flux is a, um, it's, it's got a um, microservice architecture, so it's broken down. It's a set of Kubernetes controllers, and if you're not familiar with controllers, a controller in Kubernetes, um, basically de handles the life cycle of objects. So if it's like to be created, updated, deleted, whatever. Um, and so Flux is a set of these controllers and um, the, the other ones at the end are kind of off in their own land because they're not, they don't come installed on Flux, like with Flux, they're things that are things that make Flux better. Um, okay, so what do the controllers do? So the source controller actually fetches resources and stores them as artifacts. So that's the one that's listening to your source, like Git. Um, if you're using GitHub, it listens to GitHub and then it pulls all the YAMLs down and stores them. And then the customized controller comes along and applies the manifest. So there's some confusion sometimes about why the customized controller is named that way. Um, it's actually named the customized controller, because I know it can be confusing with customization. So it's named that way because it's actually looking for a customization.yaml. If it exists in that location that you give the customized controller, it will just apply the files that are mentioned there. So let's say you have eight YAMLs, but in the customization.yaml you only mention four, it'll only apply the four. But if there's not a customization.yaml in that location, it will only, it will actually uh, grab all the YAMLs and it basically itself creates a customization.yaml on its side and it'll apply them all. So you don't need a customization.yaml, but if you're using one with like overlays and you know, base, like yeah, so you can, you can still do that. Um, and so that, the customized controller actually runs manifest generation using customize, so it'll apply them. And then the Helm controller manages deployment of Helm charts. And the Helm, the way Helm, the Helm controller is set up within Flux is really, really fantastic. Um, Helm support is really, really awesome with Flux. Um, and so you can like mention within your source controller to listen to a Helm repository and then have um, a Helm release. And the Helm controller will be looking for an object called Helm release and it'll um, apply whatever Helm chart is specified there. So then the notification controller handles inbound and outbound um, messages. So it's, it's our notification dispatch, which I was mentioning earlier. You can set it up alerting to like Slack or something and you would use the notification controller to do that. Then we have the um, image controllers. So the image reflector controller, um, up to, it, it reflects image metadata for the automation controller, which then actually updates YAML when new container images are available. So what that means is like if you in your image repository have a new image version of whatever app you're using within your product, 
um, and a new version is updated, it'll actually be listening to that repository and it'll update your YAMLs to reflect that. And so that's a really neat feature that I feel like sometimes is underrated with Flux. Um, these two controllers don't come bootstrapped by default. If you are using bootstrap to set up, uh, you have to add an additional like flag to have bootstrap install them. So, all right. And then it works with um, a lot of other tools. It's really fantastic. Like I, I, these are not even an extensive list, but these are the ones that I find pretty valuable. Um, and so, and the reasons like I've heard from other people and myself um, love Flux is that it really does just make life easier. It made our deployment process a lot simpler at the company I was working for. And the multi-tenancy is really, really simple to set up. It's actually very, very powerful. Like I said, my, my personal experience is more with soft multi-tenancy, but I have seen multi-cluster setups and it's really cool. Um, depends on is a really valuable feature that I will be talking about kind of in my demo, but um, this is neat because if you have something that needs to be stood up before something else gets stood up, you can tell the Terraform, you can tell, uh, sorry, I'm stuck on the Terraform, you can tell Flux to like wait to deploy the other thing until the health checks for the first thing come back as solid. Um, and then the Helm integration, like I mentioned, is really good with Flux. And um, notifications and alerting is really simple to set up, actually. Very easy to set up to like tell you, hey, this is wrong or something like that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the Flux CLI is really user friendly. And it Bootstrap is a really simple way to get started with Flux. Um, and then, <laughs> not I guess I shouldn't say and now, but like it's been there for a little while. But it, one of the things I'm most excited about with Flux is the Terraform controller. I'm a big fan of Terraform and um, yeah, it just, it adds a lot of value in my opinion because how many people here are using Terraform? Yeah, yeah, so y'all get it. Um, so it's pretty exciting, right? That like now Flux can actually manage your Terraform deployments and you'll get away from configuration drift. Like there's a lot of things that Flux brings that now the Terraform controller gets to bring too. So the Terraform controller is a Flux controller. So it's not part of the actual Flux project umbrella. It's a separate um, controller that's still free and open source, but it was created by Weaveworks separately and it's outside the project. So you have to install it. Um, the, prefer I, like, the way I install it is through a Helm chart and I'll show that in a second. But um, basically now Terraform resources that can be managed are not even limited to Kubernetes resources, which is exciting. So in the demo I'm gonna show, sorry, I'm getting tangled in my <laughs> cords. Um, the demo I'm gonna show is, um, is uh, setting up EKS with Terraform. So. That's really exciting. Um, and so, yeah, these are some links. If you are interested in the Terraform controller, this is where you can find it. And so that's like the first add-on I wanted to show. And then um, also there's, there's lots of different ways that we recommend you can use it. And you know, there's, there's, if you're already using GitOps, you can start using the Flux, the Terraform controller as well in that way to do your deployments. But there is one that I wanna kinda hit on here that um, I like emphasizing. So if you're already, if you're married to like, you know, doing your pipeline as your way of doing Terraform deployments, you can still set up Flux and the Terraform controller to notify you if for some reason anything gets out of sync. So I, I, it's, I don't have it set up in this demo, but I, um, if you go online and you look up like some of my other Terraform controller talks, if you're interested, there's um, one demo I've done in the past where I have a vault instance set up and, um, it's using Terraform to like in initialize the vault instance and like also it sets up a secret and I go in and intentionally delete the secret and you can see in Slack that it immediately notifies me that hey, the secret's been deleted and you know, it was, it was in your Terraform. So you can have it do that. In, in my demo, I also go a step further and I have it auto apply. So you can see like within the next minute, it's already, the secret's already back in the um, vault instance. But if you are not interested in having it do automatic, um, configuration drift like that, you can still have it do drift detection, which is super valuable. Yeah. So these are some of the features of the Terraform controller. There's a lot more. It's always changing too. There's there's constantly new features being added to it, which is really cool. But um, yeah, you can do manual or auto approvals, like I said before. I mean, not everyone wants to have um, your Terraform being applied right away. There's there's several like reasons to want to see the plan first before you actually apply it. And so you can do manual approvals and it'll, um, you can set it up to also um, store the, the 
plan as a config map, which is a really neat thing. So then you can like set it up as a human readable config map and output it and then see like, do I want this and then apply it. So yeah. Um, and then there's drift detection, like I mentioned. Um, it can accept a list of config map secrets as variables. Um, and then the state file is stored by default in a secret, in a Kubernetes secret, but I'm gonna show in my example where I'm using Terraform Cloud actually as the storage, but you can use whatever you're using. If you're using S3, keep using S3, that's fine. Whatever you're using to store your, your uh, state files is fine. Um, it does support multiple types. Um, yeah, so you can, um, Oh, so one thing that was recently updated on it is concurrency. So now it can actually run, it uses um, runners, which is cool because now you can customize the runner pod with an image. You can um, also run a lot more jobs concurrently. I think there was a test with, I think 1500 um, uh, modules and that happened very quickly. So yeah, um, and you can use an OCI artifact as a source, much like with Flux, so. The next one I wanna talk about, the next tool that's a great extension of Flux is the GitOps tools for Flux Visual Studio Code extension. That is a mouthful. Um, but <laughs> I think it's called the GitOps tool for, tools for Flux if you go to the um, VS Code uh, um, extension library. So it's an extension basically to enhance the developer experience. Um, if you're already developing in VS Code, it's really neat. And I'll show it in a second too, but it's really neat because you can see all your your sources, your customizations, whatever, right there. And um, if I wanna like reconcile it, I can, or if I wanna suspend it. So let's say I make a change and I don't want that change to go in yet. I'm like, ah, no, 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 this is a bug and I don't want it to go in yet and I catch it in time. So I can go in and I can suspend the source or the customization. Uh, if I suspend the source, it will never even pull those artifacts, but if I suspend the customization, it just won't apply them. So I can suspend it and then resume it when I'm ready which is cool. Um, yeah, so it's an intuitive way to manage troubleshoot and operate your Kubernetes environment following the GitOps operating model. And it's really just, yeah, it's an easy way to integrate into your deployment lifecycle and it really does make life easier. I, I like it after working with it. Um, so we have GitOps is another, like I think the last one I wanted to mention. Um, so we get asked a lot about a UI for Flux and this is this is that answer. So. It's a web UI that surfaces key information to help application operators easily discover and resolve issues. Um, it's kind of like, there, it does some of the features I mentioned that like the VS Code extension can do as well. So it'll list all your like, um, your sources, your customizations, all those things, as well as um, you can see all your like Flux deployment and everything. And um, it's, it's really an in intuitive interface that provides a guided experience to build understanding um, and, and like it really is a simplification of the user experience. So um, this is free and open, it is free and open source. So you can just install it and it, again, you can install it through a Helm chart. So very similarly. In my demo, I'm actually using Weave GitOps Enterprise. So that is a, that is a thing, but this is, this like Weave GitOps is free and open source and it does provide a really nice and easy to use um, UI. But don't get confused because the one I'm about to show is not free, <laughs> but but I'll but I'll explain. So um, okay, so let me let me go in here first. Oh, that is tiny. Let me let me fix that. Is that better? Okay, cool. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to mention is this command. Whoa! I'll just uh, I'll copy that into here and see if. So can you all see that? Is that big enough, that command? I just wanted to highlight it real fast. So this command is the um, flux bootstrap command. This is the one I kept mentioning with the flux CLI. So if you run this command, what it's doing, it's doing a multitude of things, but it it's saying within that, like my username in GitHub, it's going to create, if it doesn't already exist, it's gonna create a repository tfc-wge-demo and if the repository does exist, it'll just bootstrap into the existing repository. Um, and it, it, so that path is actually telling the customization controller what to apply within this project. And now that's confusing a little bit, but I'll, I'll show you like an example of what I mean. So if I run that, it's going to um, 
bootstrap into this folder right here, this clusters slash my cluster folder. And the nice thing about this command is it's actually idempotent. And if I run it again, so let's say I go and I update the Flux CLI version, then I run this command again, it'll actually update all those manifests to the latest version of Flux, it, assuming I'm on the latest version of the CLI. So that's really cool. You can just keep running this command and it'll just keep you know updating it. So what that command does is it, if it's being run for the first time and this does not exist, it's creating this GOTK components YAML which has the namespace that's created for Flux system. Flux system is the namespace that gets created where everything gets housed. So um, all the controllers get installed in here and um, this is the namespace you'll go to if you're ever trying to troubleshoot Flux. Um, and then if you like, this is a huge file, but if you scroll down, you'll have like our CRDs that are necessary for Flux. If you keep scrolling, you'll get to all the like actual controller deployments and everything. So th that's all stored in here. And then we have GOTK sync that gets created. And it's scrolled down. Um, so in here, what this one is doing is it's actually setting up your, um, the, the first part is that, that source that gets created. So this is what's telling the source controller, hey, go, the, the type is a Git repository. So um, go look at this URL and then, you know, pull artifacts from there. And then the customization controller, and oh, and it's happening every minute. So it's telling the source controller, hey, every minute, go check this um, URL and, and pull artifacts. And then the customization controller is running every 10 minutes and it's going to apply whatever's in this path. And remember I said, if there is a customization.yaml, like in this case there is, then it'll apply whatever's specified in here. But if there's not, it'll apply whatever YAMLs it finds. Um, in this case, I do have a customization.yaml that's calling out all these YAMLs intentionally. Um, and then, so, okay, so that's the first thing I wanna show. And then, I got a list of things. <laughs> so, um, I uh, can show y'all the pods that were stood up too. So there's a lot more in here than would have just been bootstrapped, but um, the, the controllers, these controllers were created by um, the bootstrap command. And then I also installed the Terraform controller and like I said, it's really easy to set up. So it's just like this. Um, so it's through, like I said, you, you tell the Helm, you tell the, so the source controller, hey, there's this Helm repository to go listen to. So this is telling the source controller to go look at this URL every hour. And then this Helm release is actually what is saying like I want this chart, like this specific chart to be um, deployed and it's also where you can give all the values as well. So it's really actually pretty neat the way that it's set up. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, um, sorry, okay, yeah, so in um, here, let me log in. Backwards. Okay, so um, in here, so I mentioned this is this is our um, enterprise offering, but um, if you were to go like to the open source we go, um, it would still show you like the applications and the sources and everything like that. This just has a little bit more in here. So one feature I wanted to show off was this templates feature. And like I said, you don't have to use it to do this demo. It's, it's totally optional, but um, I created a template and the way I did that is through um, like a file like this. So it's just called GitOps template. And I, I set up what I wanted it to look like. So in order to use the Terraform controller, you actually um, create a Terraform object. So that like, like if you're noticing a pattern, um, all the like the um, application type controllers are looking for like things that are very specific to them. So like the customization controller is looking for a customized object and the Helm release Helm controller is looking for a Helm release and Terraform controller is looking for a Terraform object. So um, within this, you, you tell it um, like what Terraform files you want to apply and like so what modules and then um, so like this is the path to the module and then you can specify all the variables and um, in this case I'm saying write outputs to secret. So that's a, that's a feature that the Terraform controller can do. It can write um, outputs to a Kubernetes secret. 
And then um, in here, you can also specify a um, cloud backend. So if you're using Terraform Cloud, is anyone using Terraform Cloud here? Oh, okay, cool, a couple. So um, you can actually set it up pretty easily. So it's you don't have to even set up a backend.tf. You just set it up like this. And one cool thing that we tested out with this is that if you do it this way, you can, let's say this workspace doesn't already exist, it'll create it on the fly. So um, that's a really cool thing. So, so like when I, when I um, go back into templates, and if I was to use this template and I, I type in a, whatever cluster name I wanted, which is what I did to set that one up, I, um, it, it creates the workspace name the same way in Terraform Cloud and um, it'll, it'll stand it up if it doesn't already exist, which is neat. Okay, so that's what's happening there. And then um, my Terraform modules are, um, so I have two. Uh, in, in here you can see like in my, um, this, this file, you can see that I have the um, TFC like core, so my demo core, and then I have one down here that's config. So, and then the, the last, like the, the key component I have that's different in here is this depends on. So this is cool, if you're a Terraform Cloud user, you'll understand how cool this feature is, but in workspaces you can't, or like in Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise, you can't actually say, I want this workspace to run before this one. Um, and with depends on, you can force that action. So, like I mentioned earlier, with depends on, you're telling Flux, wait until the next, like this, this thing is healthy and already running to run the next one. So. This, this config, this config won't even run. The workspace won't even run until the core workspace, the plan and apply are actually done. So that's cool. Um, because in this case, my core is actually setting up the EKS clusters. Pretty s simple setup. And then my um, config is actually setting up like the auth and you know settings within the cluster. So that's what's happening. And then um, if I go to Terraform Cloud, you can see, sorry, workspaces. Um, you can see that uh, I have these two here that um, have both run. And then if I go to um, EKS, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can see my um, demo one that was created here. And I can actually go in and look at my resources. So I wouldn't be able to do that if the config hadn't worked either because I wouldn't have authentic authentication to any of, to view anything. Um, and then within the v within VS Code, I did want to show the extension that I mentioned. Sorry, I'm like, oh, it's right there, okay. Um, so this is the GitOps extension that I was talking about in VS Code, which is really cool because so you can see all my sources listed here. And if I if I click on them, I can actually see like, you know, what was stood up. And if I right click on it, I can like reconcile, suspend, um, delete. I can do whatever I want in here, which is neat. If you're developing within VS Code, you can say like, I get push and then immediately go and reconcile it, which is like, which is a nice thing to do. Um, and then within Weave GitOps Enterprise, there's actually a Terraform section, which shows um, your Terraform deployment. So if you click on one, you can actually see um, the YAML, you can see like the dependencies. So in this case, you can see that um, you know the config depends on the core being created first. So yeah, that's um, that's that's pretty cool. And then the the templates feature is nice because in my experience, when we had to create a bunch of EKS clusters, we had to um, there was a lot of work to be done, especially when you're like we were using Terraform Enterprise, and we had to then go create a Terraform Enterprise like workspace, and it was just like a whole mess. But this is cool because you can just come in here and be like, oh, you need a EKS cluster. I'm just gonna use this template and create it for you. So that's a really neat feature. That is exclusive to enterprise though. So that's a, that's a catch. Oh, and then um, in Terraform Cloud, I discovered this feature that was pretty cool. I don't remember seeing it before, so I don't know if it's new or if I just like missed it but variable sets is really cool. So this is how I passed, I see you nodding. This is how I passed um, my, my AWS credentials to all the workspaces. And this is really neat because I can click on it. So I can say, um, I want these credentials to be applied to all workspaces in the organization. And that's powerful because remember, my workspaces are being created on the fly. So I don't know what they are. I, I can't go, I, I, I could go in and individually give them all variables. But now I can just say, you know what, I'll give all of them these credentials, including my, you know, 
access key, and um, it'll be applied to all of them. And the nice thing about Terraform Cloud is that if, if it's mark sensitive, I can't even go edit it. Like, I can't even go see it now. If I want to change it, I have to literally delete it and create a new one, which is really good. And it won't show up in, like, your plans or anything like that. So it's pretty neat. Um, yeah. Uh, and now I'll, I'll see if there's any questions. I think I went over everything on my notes. Yeah. 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 Oh, wait. Uh, can we? Can we? Here. I think the recording won't catch you, sorry. I don't. Yeah, no, you're fine. Here, I turned it on, I think. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to make you say it all over again. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just saying that um, so there's also an option of Terraform agents. So you can have those agents, let's say the uh, EC2 instance or whatever, closest to, to, to your data center or cloud. And so you can also punt some of this mm -hmm. down to the agent. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. A vault. So you can still use variable sets for yeah. other things yeah. and, and still have yet another protection layer. That's a very good point, yeah, yeah. Are we doing questions? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I think I'm gonna just like kinda <laughs> throw, <laughs> cut you off Yeah, um, awesome. I will bring the microphone to you. If you have a question, please raise your hand. You mentioned Helm. Uh, mm -hmm. How about Helm file? Does that have you heard of that? Ex wait, um, maybe I'm just miss. No, maybe I'm like explain a little bit. Sorry. I think Helm file is a, a wrapper on Helm. Mm. So I'm just wondering if you had heard of it. Sounds familiar. It does sound familiar. Uh, I don't know. This sounds like an exciting conversation. Yeah, maybe we'll talk after. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, for Terraform, does it support different versions of Terraform? Yeah. Um, so it does. At the same time? Ooh. <laughs> I. Because I, if you're upgrading different. No, I don't see why it wouldn't actually. Okay. I, I think it, I, I've, I've used it and I've never even like had to mention what version. So, Yeah, you define it, but would it support it is my question. Because no, she's asking like specifically the Terraform controller, I think, right? Yeah, the, yeah. the Terraform controller. It does, Because yeah. if you're in the process of upgrading your Terraform, half of the code is in one version, the other half yeah. is already upgraded. Yeah, no, it, it, I've never run into that issue. The only thing I was going to say is there's a CLI that's being like, it's still worked on, so I don't really mention it. But it's kind of, it's similar to Flux where like you can, it's called the TFCTL. TFCTL, something like something like that, um, and it's it's really good. But then in that one, you have to mention it because when you're trying to get like the plan to output, it's it's specific to the version. But if you are like you know trying to use it, th there's this really good documentation I didn't really mention that's in here, and um, it does a um, it has like a lot of things like how to do things, and um, yeah, no Terraform that's not an issue. No. It's really cool, yeah. I've actually never run into that. Awesome. All right, I have another question. Hey, sorry I missed the first 10 no, minutes. No, no um, worries. Uh, I'm very interested in continuous integration and, and sort of the Atlantis workflow of showing diffs. Yeah. Um, how does, does Flux do that? How, how would you implement that? The CLI for Flux has a, a, a Flux diff command um, that can like show you what would, what would be the change. Um, which I think is, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with, like I've never actually used it myself, but um, I've, I, I think that would be like what you're looking for, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it depends on like what you're, so if you're talking about Terraform, that's true. If you're talking about just Flux in general, if like YAMLs, then, then you would use Flux diff, yeah, or, or even Helm charts, it'll show you that too, yeah. 